Hey y'all, this is Culture Soup, where tech, culture, and business collide. It's a podcast that spoons up everything hot from social media. I'm your host, L. Michelle Smith, and each episode we bring you some of the most notable and not yet notable thought leaders in tech, business, and culture. The date was March 20th, 2019. In fact, that was last Wednesday. I had the honor of moderating an event with the Black Sports Professionals Network of North Texas. It was their second annual Hidden Figures event where they honored women who were sheroes in the sports industry, killing it in a male-dominated industry. I had the honor of interviewing three women who have made pioneering moves in the sports industry all at the same time, live in front of the membership of the Black Sports Professionals Network and also others in the community who packed the house at the Lincoln Experience Center at the Star at Dallas Cowboys headquarters in Frisco, Texas. I want to share that with you today. We did it here in Dallas, but you know what? With the global audience of the Culture Soup podcast, I wanted to share with you the very exciting and inspirational experience that happened that day. Without further ado, myself, yours truly, Daniel Sorensi Jones, the CEO of Power Hands, NFL agent Nicole Lynn, and COO of College Football Playoff, Andrea Williams. These ladies cap off our special series for Women's History Month, Authentically She. Ladies and gentlemen, a special edition of the Culture Soup Podcast. This instant replay is brought to you by Power Hands. bios like I do. So I want to give context for why you're even here today. So tell us, starting with Andrea, how you got here? Well, sitting in an hour with the traffic, <laughs> which I'm sure many of you Agreed. did. Uh, but I think part of the reason why we're all here is the fact of networking, um, extending our reach and those individuals who are within our network. And with that, there's a gentleman in our office by the name of Will Baggett who made the introduction to someone here at BSP and said, hey, this might be someone that you want to meet. Um, that fell into an invitation to join us here this evening. And I'm grateful to be in the presence of just greatness um, with everybody in the crowd and certainly my guests that are up here with me today on the panel. So can't wait to get started. Awesome. And you know what? I noticed in your bio that you actually went to school for sports administration, correct? The second time. The second time. Yes, the first time I didn't know better. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. So we'll, we'll talk more about your journey to COO of college football playoff soon. Nicole. Uh, so in the literal sense, again, yeah, a, a couple hours of traffic. I'm actually based in Houston, Texas. Um, I am great friends with Danielle, and we connected through some of my athletes, and so Power Hands has been a really great brand um, and marketing opportunity for some of my athletes, and so it's great when you're able to uh, do work with other women of color. So a little black girl magic. Awesome. <laughs> and Nicole, you have some tie to a rapper named Lil Wayne, somebody like that? A little bit, a little, little bit. bit. <laughs> All right. My boss. We'll talk about that too. Danielle. Well, since she took time to talk about Power Hands, and she really didn't explain why I asked her to be here, I'm gonna take a moment to talk about my girl a little bit. So when Larry and Nicole approached me about being on the panel, thank you so much, uh, I was very flattered and humbled. But as my husband says, I can't just sit back and do something, I gotta get involved. <laughs> so I thought, hey, how can I help? 
how can I get involved? How can power hands really get involved in a movement when it comes to exposing the greatness that women are doing in sports? And one of the first people that I thought about was Nicole because of the great things that she's doing, not only just being an agent, but she is uh, manages talent and just her voice in sports is huge. So thank you for accepting the call. Thank you, Andrea, thank you, Michelle, and thank you all for being here. Networking, an opportunity for us to learn, and 2019 is all about collaboration. Yes. You're gonna hear me say that over and over mm -hmm. and over again. 2018 was about exposure, that were great, and 2019 is about collaboration. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Great. Let's start with the topic of entrepreneurship. Right now in this current environment, black women are entrepreneurs more than any other diversity segment or even the larger population in the majority. It's amazing. Yes. You two are examples of that. Do you have any tips and advice for people who are wanting to be entrepreneurs it's, it's easier now more than ever with the internet, wouldn't you say? Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. So some of the advice that I have is, I took a different route, so I don't do my sports job full time. I mean, I, I say I do both of my jobs full time, so I'm an attorney at a law firm, and I do that, and I bill 2,300 hours a year. If you are a lawyer, you understand that that's nuts. Um, and then I'm also a sports agent full time, and the way that I've been an entrepreneur is by keeping a check, right? Something that consistently comes in, and I started sports as a side hustle. And I think that there's a lot of ways to be an entrepreneur. You can jump all in and you know, start a product or start a business, or you can start a side hustle. And then that side hustle becomes your job. And so now I'm in a position where I've got to make a decision, right? I've got two full-time jobs. Um, I can't do that forever. And so <laughs> something's going to have to give. But that is the way that, I, that I'm an entrepreneur. Um, and so, yeah. Well, so we have that in common. Yes. yes. <laughs> Danielle? And, and I would have to agree with Nicole. You know, I talk to uh, so many entrepreneurs, and the word entrepreneur has become so trendy. People think that you just have to jump. Mm -hmm. No, there. Are, first of all, everyone in this room should have tendencies of being an entrepreneur. Whether you're in school, you work for corporate America, whatever you're doing, we should make sure that we are doing something to maximize our gifts, where we get supplemental income coming in. And for me, that's what entrepreneurialism is. Well, with Power Hands, we did jump. And it's not an easy road. And if I have to summarize and think about two things that have really defined that jump, you know, I listen to Will Smith all the time talking about <laughs> when, he, when he jumped. You know, for me, it has really been, and it still is a journey, but focus and tenacity. Guys, I got my way in corporate America, Girl Scouts growing up. I was never told no. Like, I was spoiled. <laughs> Being an entrepreneur, yeah. I cannot tell you. If you don't have tenacity to listen to the 200 no's to get you to your right yes, that will change your trajectory of your business. If you don't have the patience to understand how to wait the storm out, then you won't get there. So tenacity is so very, very important. And then the focus piece, you know, it's hard to be great doing one thing. But then if you're trying to do many things, and if you're an entrepreneur, you're an innovator. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna wanna create and do things over and over and over and over again. But what you're trying to do is create a sustainable business model that is attractive in creating revenue in your sleep. Try to stay focused and do that in one area before you pivot to many others. Awesome, awesome. So, Andrea, you have a different path. I was a student athlete mm -hmm. at Texas A&M University. Any Aggies? No Aggies? No Aggies? Oh, yeah, there, there, there we go. go. We're going to ignore the Longhorn in the front. I don't even see him right now. Um, but that really was part of my path. And even before then, um, I had a, a father at home that really instilled in the family, it's important to be successful, but part of that is getting a good education, and a great way to get an education is to get it for free. Yeah. And I was the baby of three siblings, and I had an older sister who's actually here this evening. Hello, Amanda. And, and hey, Amanda. <laughs> 
and an older brother, and both of them went on to get Division One scholarships. Awesome. So I think Sweet. I had a false sense of self. Oh, that's what you do. You you go on, you get a scholarship, you get your education paid for. Okay, let's do that. Um, but I was just so honored to be able to play two sports at a and and that really did introduce me to the world of college athletics. Volleyball and, and basketball. Volleyball and basketball. Wow, girl. I sat on the bench so well. I mean, I was <laughs> They were never at a Gatorade, let me tell you. And so that, that was really the start. And at the time, and, and I enjoy talking to student athletes now to say, what do you know about your athletic director? What do you know about the administrators that work in your athletics department in terms of what they're doing for you? And at the time, I wasn't aware. Yeah. I didn't know what all these people who were around and wearing suits and wearing their polos with their nice logo on there, what was their responsibility? But ultimately, after the fact, I learned that they were working hard to make sure that I had a positive and meaningful experience. Right. So that meant going to class, getting the right grades, staying eligible, but also developing for life after sport. Yeah. And we don't tell that story enough, mm -hmm. and I don't think a lot of the public and the media really carry that theme in terms of all the wonderful things that are afforded to our student athletes on campus from being a student athlete. Right. And I certainly would not be here among these beautiful, wonderful women if it had not been for sports in college. Wow, that's awesome. Do you ladies have women um, role models that you looked up to in sports at all, or were they male? And that's okay too. Like, that's a fair question, I'll go, mm -hmm. I'll jump in first. I think my first role models were my father, mm -hmm. were my sister, and then you're absolutely right, it was men. Yeah. And you only knew them to say they, they excel at what they do, so I want to be like them. Mm -hmm. It wasn't necessarily a gender mm -hmm. thing. For me, my favorite basketball um, player was Magic Johnson. So that's what my dad came to the gym and said, okay, he can shoot, he can dribble, he can post up. This is how you need to you know, position yourself right. in the game. So this is how you learn. Right. And so I just looked at him as someone who perfected his craft, and I wanted to excel like that in the I love it. Danielle Nicole. As it relates to a role model, I mean, and my, my mother is in the room coincidentally, but um, we all, of course, you know, when we, we look at people that impacted our lives, and I think of my past, and I think of my present, and I think of who I want to be in my future, there is certainly that peace that will never go away that my mother always instilled in me. And I watched her as she was in committees. I watched her as she was committed to church. I watched her as she was committed to us. And you hear that one word that I'm using over and over and over again, and it's a commitment piece. And that's what has gotten me to the point that I am today. I try to do what I say that I'm going to do, represent who I say that I am, have integrity about myself, and that commitment is attributed to that wonderful lady in the green that's sitting over there. So seriously, that's, uh, that, was, that was my role model. And um, from a career journey standpoint, I will certainly say that, you know, um, I have had amazing men that are white that have pulled me up, that gave me my first opportunity, white women that gave me my opportunity. I'm now understanding the beautiful network of black girl magic and I love it. So um, I advise you to find someone and different people that support you no matter what they look like. They just need to deposit it to you and you deposit it to Awesome, them. awesome. So I never had a role model, I'm gonna to be totally frank with that. I, I just didn't. Um, I grew up kind of different, um, really a, in poverty, growing up in a car, uh, homeless, and so my daily struggle was just what am I gonna eat? You know, I didn't have those kind of those kind of role models. But I will say, being in sports and now where I am, um, what's more important to me than a role model is a sponsor and a mentor. There you go. And so I talk a lot about that. If you ever want to get into the business of sports or any industry generally, you need to have both of those, a sponsor and a mentor. Those two words are not synonyms. They are different people, and it's important that you have both. Okay, a mentor is someone, in the, in the short version, is that you can ask the stupid questions to, right? That can hold your hand along in the process you can be vulnerable with. A sponsor is someone that has the ability to hit on a table for you, right? They have some type of power, right? They have an ability to move the trajectory of your career. I'm not as vulnerable with my sponsor. I don't really show my mistakes to my sponsor. I'm a boss to my sponsor, right? right. And so you need to have both of those. And so when I wanted to get into sports, I didn't necessarily have a role model, but I knew I needed a mentor. 
and I knew I needed a sponsor, my mentor was a white man, right? and still is to this day. Um, they're just, maybe in an agent, there's 34 women out of right. 8, 900, yeah. only 12 that have clients, only one or two that are black. Right. I don't have anybody to look to, so I didn't have to go to work. Right. <laughs> And if you have performance excellence, mm -hmm. that's your way into the game. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Wow. This is good stuff, y'all. <laughs> All right. So, Nikki, yeah, I want to go back to you. Yeah. You started out in the medical arena, pharma. Oh, yeah. Talk about that, because you made that jump, and you were in corporate. I was, yeah. I um, started out green in medical device. My first job after undergrad. Um, graduating from Florida International University. Are there any golden knights in the room? No. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm a Florida girl. Graduated from uh, Florida International University. Started working with a company um, uh, called Diagnostic Imaging that was gobbled up by a big company called Phillips Medical System. So very quickly, I was emerged. Green didn't know what in the world I was doing, but I knew that I had to figure it out. And I knew that medical device was going to take me somewhere. No one taught me how to sell a medical device. I stood in front of the person that I got the job and he said, sell a pen. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> sell a pen? Is this my entry level into medical device? Okay, but I'm going to show you I'm going to sell a pen. I'm going to be sales rep of the year. And then a white woman pulled me up, mm -hmm. who was the chief marketing officer, and made me the director of private label. And that was my experience into the corporate side. So I got out of the field, moved up to corporate side, did many things there, um, and then moved to Medtronic, which is the largest medical device company of the world. It's over. $30 billion, and I took a job that I had never done before just to get in. Mm -hmm. I was laid off from my other job with Phillips Medical Systems, took a director of sales training and development. I was like, what the heck is this? But I'm going to figure it out again. Only African-American woman as a director within all of Medtronic. And I then moved to several other positions and got mentors, mm -hmm. sponsors, and advocates from there. And then, oh my gosh, 2019, I am pregnant. I've just gotten married. We just built a house. We're broke because we spent too much money on the wedding and the house. <laughs> and my <laughs> co-founder, <laughs> oh, 2013. <laughs> to have 
walked into a brand new situation. Mm -hmm. um, I had spent the last 10 years in Chicago with the Big Ten Conference and was the first female commissioner for the Big Sky Conference. And it was, <laughs> it was not only an incredible experience professionally, but personally. Right. And um, when you talk about going out on faith and taking, taking that leap, and if you have prepared yourself, if you've gotten your knowledge, your education, um, it's certainly not gonna matter what the opportunity is in front of you because you're gonna be prepared. Right. And where you have deficiencies, you're going to learn and you're gonna make sure um, that you're ready to step into um, that next opportunity and that's what was afforded to me. Right. And it was great, it was short-lived. I didn't think it was just gonna be two years, but here I'm in Dallas and so grateful for this opportunity as well. That's awesome. I'm, I'm feeling a takeaway here. And that is if you're going to pioneer in any part of any kind of industry, you may not find that if you're a pioneer by definition, you won't find people like you, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. So when it comes to your kitchen cabinet, your personal board of directors, I heard from all of you, there was diversity, in other words, people who weren't like you. Absolutely. So you had to have some trust, right? Yeah. 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 Anybody want to talk about that? Especially in Utah. <laughs> Utah's amazing, but I think Collective commission later, um, but you, you talk about those folks that inspire you yeah. and leaning into something that may be uncomfortable, right. um, and that's okay. But when you have individuals around you that you can be vulnerable with, too, and they truly want what's best for you, because not everybody who is in your presence, in your office, in your life, is for you. <laughs> And as soon as we get that opportunity to discern those who are in the circle that we talked about, the mentor, right. the sponsor, we like to call it our tribe, those who are going to uplift you, but more so than just being your cheerleader, but to hold you to hold you accountable. When you're not living your best life, when you're not living up to your potential, someone who can call you out on your stuff and say, I know you can be better, I know you can reach higher. Mm -hmm. And that comes in all shapes, sizes, forms, colors. Right. Nicole, let's talk about authenticity. I spent a lot of time talking about um, the Catalyst study that called black women double outsiders in corporate America. And what that means is that the power structure is built around white men. And so when we show up, we're the exact opposite, our gender, our color. All of this talk, though, about showing up authentically, how do we show up authentically as black women when we're outsiders? Yes, it's tough. So I don't know if you've all heard the concept of covering, right? Covering is when you cover something important about yourself to to uh, fit in with what they say like the dominant culture is, mm -hmm. right? So that's the, the concept of covering. I do my best not to cover. And so I work as an attorney at a, the third largest law firm in the world. I'm one of a few black women out of thousands of attorneys, right? So every day I'm working with white men and I have to make a decision not to cover. On my sports side, I walk into the NFL Combine, there are thousands of men and I'm usually one or two of the only women in the room. And so I have to find a way to, to stay professional um, and then also be true to myself. It's difficult when you don't have a trailblazer, when you are the trailblazer, when you are the pioneer. So for example, when I go to NFL games, I have to figure out what I'm gonna wear. Mm -hmm. Am I being too sexy? Is my lipstick too much? Are my heels too high? I got nobody to ask, I got nobody to look to. Yeah. But I wanna be true to myself. I wanna be feminine, I am, and that's important to me, but I wanna be professional, where's the balance? And so it's difficult when you got no one to look to, um, but it's important to me. So I still struggle with it. I, I consider myself authentic. I, I have a big presence on social media that most agents don't, right? My peers think it's nuts, but I do it because it's a way for me to mentor to people. You know, I'm very transparent about what I do. Don't stop. Um, but thank you. I appreciate that. You know, but some people don't like it, but I'm not for everybody. Um, the other thing about covering is, you know, I struggle with it every day. I've still never wore braids around my clients. Love braids. Used to always wear braids. Haven't been able to do it yet. You know, it's a struggle. You know, that's me being transparent and vulnerable with you all. I've been wanting micro braids for so long that I just can't do it yet. So, so there we are. turning up and turning down the black girl magic. She called it style flexing. Can you talk to that, Danielle? When you walk into a room and you kind of feel the room and you know whether or not 
to go all the way there. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I struggled with this my entire corporate career. Mm -hmm. I was the um, only one of the very few women and the uh, other women that were in the room that were not women of color, they were trying to act like the guys. And I refused to do that because I am not one that can drink all night and then wake up in the morning and be productive. That's never been me. I'm not gonna be able to do it, so I'm not gonna go hang out at the bar. I've never been one to say a thousand curse words. That's never been me. I'm not gonna do it. But I was ostracized. Mm -hmm. I, was, I didn't fit in with everybody because I wasn't at the bar doing those things. I didn't curse all the time. So throughout my entire corporate career, it was really hard for me to be true Danielle because I was struggling with, oh my gosh, I'm still from Jacksonville, Florida, and I like to play spades, and I also like to wear my six inch heels, but I like to wear my sneakers, but I'm still trying to fight this battle of you think I'm this spiritual girl that you can't say things around, right? that I'm a goody two shoes. And I'm also trying to get a seat at the table, but now, but now, when I tell you that I am so free and I feel so good being who I am and that's the only way I deliver the best Danielle, Absolutely. I struggle with the same thing going to certain conferences. We are the only women. Well, you know what? You're going to love me and my first time I wore faux locks. You're going to love me in my faux locks because you know what? What's coming out of my mouth in my faux locks is going to be brilliant. I love it. <laughs> You're going to love me in my six inch heels or my sneakers. And once I forgot about all that, and again, I can't believe I keep quoting Will Smith, but it was so awesome. <laughs> because Will Smith has like millions and millions and millions of dollars, but Will just posted something and he said, Aren't you so free when you just really don't give up? Yeah. <laughs> it's true. And when you're so comfortable and you love yourself within and you know what you offer and deliver, like you get to the point where you just don't care what other people think. Yeah. Either they're going to be with you and like you or they're not. And I'm cool with that. Because as Nicole said, we're not for everybody. Oh, oh that's awesome. Um, Andrea, that's you. Michelle. College football playoff. <laughs> I didn't know where she was going. <laughs> College football playoff actually has several women on staff. Almost all women. Do I understand that correctly? We, we are a small staff okay. of about 20 individuals, which we have Team Awesome in the house. We've got some CFP. Hey. six additional interns, and majority of our office are women. Uh, majority of our office are people of color. How did this happen? And I, this is I awesome. just got there, so I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> so full credit goes to you know our leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill Hancock is our executive director, and I had the good fortune of working with him back um, in 2004 at the NCAA in Indianapolis. And it's wonderful when you have a role model, a leader, an executive who cares about not only you as a person, but cares about the job and the contribution that you can make. So at the end of the day, he wants people at the table who are gonna elevate the brand, who are gonna elevate the work, who are gonna elevate the game. And so when you surround yourself with people who are the best in the business and who aspire to be the best at what they do, you're going to have a diverse staff. So if I'm hearing you correctly, it comes from the top. Absolutely. And, and it's a value. It is, and I think it's also intentional. People can get comfortable going into rooms that look like them. Mm -hmm. And if you make a point to make sure that when we're having conversations, when we're going through the hiring process, mm -hmm. how many males, how many female, what is their background, what is their ethnicity? And we want to track that because we want to make sure that we are looking at a complete pool of individuals who can move into a position and make us better. Gotcha, gotcha. Nicole, so behind the scenes of an NFL agent, what is that like? You have to deal with all sorts of people, coaches, families, girlfriends, others. others. <laughs> expectations of those individuals so my title is sports agent but in real life I'm a life coach I'm a personal assistant I'm a 
side chick fighter offer. <laughs> When you think about a sports agent, you think about negotiating a contract, right? Negotiating a contract and talking to teams. But these contracts are only done every three to five years. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to do a contract for my draft guys sometime in April, and those contracts are three to five years. So what am I doing for three years? I set myself apart, right? It's that um, kind of that life coach and stepping in as a mentor for these men and helping them make financial decisions and helping them make personal decisions. You know, I want to be their first call, and I am. So my day, let's just example yesterday. You know, I get calls at midnight from my clients. One of my clients called me just to talk about the draft. Man, if I get drafted at this team, you know, we gonna have the best defensive scheme in the, the country or whatever. You know, just to talk. Another client, they call me because they got arrested. Um, you know, a wife is calling me, or I've got to order flowers for a client because they're, you know, it's Valentine's Day and they forgot. So it's just a little bit of everything, um, but it's exactly what I need to be doing. It's walking in purpose, and walking in purpose is so powerful, you know, so important. If you're not walking in your purpose, then you are just living and working to die, right? You're just living and working to die. And so, and so I just, I challenge everybody, if you're not walking in your purpose, to take the jump that everyone keeps talking about, and I'm, you shouldn't have given me a mic, but the, the jump. <laughs> The jump is so powerful, right? It's that jump that every single successful person has to take. Mark Zuckerberg had to leave Harvard to start Facebook, right? You know, anybody that you can think of, Mark Cuban, et cetera, all these successful people had some big jump in their life. Figure out, figure out what that is for you. That's Danielle, awesome that's awesome. That's good yeah. stuff. The gym, y'all. I hope you're taking notes. This is awesome. Look, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> you have an MBA. Uh -huh. You went to Wharton for a leadership uh, program, marketing. Um, has that given you an edge? No. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, there's people taking three. <laughs> no. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a big, big advocate for education, so don't get me wrong. I am happy that I have those degrees and credentials up under my belt. But what I have experienced mm -hmm. for the last six years <laughs> being an entrepreneur cannot be taught there you go. in any of those programs, not at all. What I have experienced completely comes from something that is innate and that is a personal drive to get to my purpose, to make sure that I leave a legacy for generations and generations. And that drives me every single day because I want our kids, our two-year-old and our five-year-old and their kids and their kids mm -hmm. to say, oh my gosh, I learned this from my great-grandparents. And they did this, they failed, but the rebound was amazing. The rebound was feedback and not a setback. And it got us to the next level to get to our right stage. So um, again, education is amazing. And I encourage everyone because let's just be truthful. I mean, we're, we don't have privilege. So the more credentials and degrees and check marks that you have, the better we will be. Yeah. But if you don't have that tenacity, that focus, that innate drive that's going to get you through those tough times, then there's no way that any of you will be sitting in this seat, this seat. We will just be sitting here. It, 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 set, it separates the people from if I said, you know what, we've got a million dollars to give away. And there are going to be people in this, for the first 10 people run up here. There'll be people in this room that will sit in their seat and say, I'll never make it up there as the first 10 people. I'm just going to sit there. And there will be people that spread, knock over the chair. And that's the mindset yeah. that separates the good yeah. from the I call it the eagles. Yes. That's right. And then yeah. the chickens. That's right. Be yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Awesome. Let's talk about inclusion. So you ladies are breaking ground, the pioneers. What does the industry need to do to bring in more women like yourselves or even other underrepresented groups? Because if I'm hearing you correctly, Innovation, the bottom line, everything is impacted when diversity is there. But you need inclusion too, 
because that's when your voice is raised, it's heard, it's understood, and it's, it's accepted. Yeah. What, what do we need to do in the sports industry to get more people that look different? From a woman's perspective, you know, there's a lot of women in the industry that have the crab in a barrel mindset. You know, when you put a whole bunch of crabs in a barrel and one starts to get out, they, they grab the person down, right? It's this weird, I don't know, this weird mentality in sports for when women get in. It's like they feel like they have to be the only one, right? You know, there were a couple of women that came before me, and I wish that they were more helpful, but it's, it's, there's this fear of losing your spot. I think we can all win. Right? I think there's a spot for everybody. Um, it's difficult in sports, you know, me, as I represent athletes, and so it's not like most of my athletes are women, and so the only way I can help women is when I'm using secondary or third resources, I'm gonna make sure I give women a chance. So my marketing reps, I'm gonna go to women first, right? If I have a financial advisor for an athlete, I'm gonna make sure a woman is, is interviewed by my athletes as well. Always giving my, any type of service for an athlete, I'm giving women a chance. And so, but yeah, it's just having a mentality that everyone can win, we can all make it to the top. I would just add being more creative and thinking outside the box. Um, working in college athletics, we have issues with attrition with women's coaches. And then not staying in the profession, not pursuing the profession of coaching, for example. And with that, it talks about you've got long hours, you're on the road a lot, they're not providing a lot of support if you are a wife or a mother. And so you have coaches now who are a new generation who are challenging the administration, who are challenging their supervisors and their bosses to say, well, I'm gonna need, when we go on this charter flight, I'm gonna need a seat for my children, for my husband. If you want us to stay late in practice because you're giving the men's basketball staff the opportunity to practice first, I'm gonna need to get extra coin so that I can pay for my nanny. And I think that administrators are now seeing that if we want to foster these women staying in this industry, we have to think differently and how we treat them. Um, women don't necessarily have the same support system at home, whereas males may have that. And so I think thinking outside the box, being more creative, and listening to those who live a different lifestyle so that we can move and modify the way that we work in order to make sure that they feel welcomed and they have the resources to be successful, but to also be more than just their position. Excellent. And then I would just make a quick comment in saying um, one of my mentors said that diversity is not a problem to solve. It's a solution, mm -hmm. the solution. Mm -hmm. So if we stop looking at diversity as a problem, and start making sure we think about it as this, the ultimate solution, then every single organization, the message that you're carrying back to your organization, that we carry back to ours, is all about inclusiveness. And frankly, I don't care if there are men in the room, those that are not afraid of their egos will absolutely admit, because my co-founder admits all the time, that women, when I tell you that we are bad ASSs, <laughs> that we can work from visionary all the way down to execution like none other, I mean, women have a capacity that I believe that we were gifted and God gave us. That's why we carry the babies. That's why we carry other stuff that comes along with pain. We created with this capacity to handle more. Well, and even black women, oh, because we struggle more. Absolutely. So transformational leadership yes. is something yes. that we can do. Yes. Excellent. So one of my sponsors has a saying you may have heard her say it, is Hasu. Oh, yeah. Her name is Sid Marshall. Uh -huh. And you may know her something around the Dallas Mavericks, right? Yeah. Hasu. Hook a sister up. <laughs> so I need to ask you, how are you reaching back and pulling your sisters along? Well, I would say we've got some sisters in the crowd tonight, and I, I would put you um, on the spot, but we're not going to make you your seats. Because I'd like to hear from you what your experience has been, even in our office. Um, but I think it's about <laughs> trouble. Um, but I think it's about not just making yourself available. And years ago, I thought that was enough, that if someone called and they wanted to meet or they wanted to talk or they wanted advice, that that was good enough. Um, as I've gotten older and I've matured and I've learned from my tribe, from my role models, from my mentors, is you just have to be intentional. I'm 
transparent. I want people to know what my journey looks like, and that is how I mentor. Um, the other thing, like I mentioned before, if there's an opportunity to put a minority or a woman in front of my client, then I will. And so everybody that styles my clients are, are minorities or women. All the financial advisors are minorities or women. And I'm always going to give the publicists, minorities or women, first, every single time. And so if you see something from one of my clients, just know they're, they're represented by women. I, I put them all on. So that was it. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, one of my uh, strength finders is I'm a connector. So you always see me connecting with a hug. Uh, in your eyes, a warm handshake, and you'll always see me introducing people to each other. So that's the first step for me. Because we do we get a lot of emails, there's a lot going on, I've got two kids, a husband, etc. But I know that part of my purpose and my passion is I was put on this earth to impact and to, to deposit into women. I have such a uh, passion for that that I want to see everyone win. I don't care what industry you're in, it could be sports, etc. Back to Nicole's point, we all can win. So there should never be a thought process of there needs to only be one. That you can't, if there's a panel, that you can't put someone on your panel that has better credentials than you right. because you want to shine. We have to think about if we're sitting here, how can we support our girlfriends when we're not on the panel? How can we support our girlfriends when we're sitting in the room? And more importantly, when they're not in the room, what are you doing to look out for your colleagues, your girlfriends, your sisters, your tribes, etc., cetera, mm -hmm. to get them to the absolute next step? So I am intentional with connecting. And if I could take on everyone, and again, I think I got this from my mother because she used that she was a teacher, so everybody used to come to our house to spend a night. So if I could take on every woman in my home every single night for us to have a mentor or a gifting session where we talk about your business and ideas and brainstorm and how you get to the next step, like that's why I want to make all the money in the world so I can do that. In my pajamas every single night, I will give advice, I will talk about failures, because I just, why fake it? Why why be a crab in a barrel? Why not want everyone in this room to succeed and to get ahead? For me, that's not doing anything but putting an X on my little ticket to get to heaven. <laughs> I want to make sure that I get there. That quote, there's a special place in where? Yeah. For women who don't share and collaborate, and I'm sure I'm making something up extra. <laughs> there's a special place, and there's a special place for women that do. We need you to bottle that up and sell it. Everywhere you go. That was I just need to make tons of money, and I can do that. <laughs> okay, it looks like we're running out of time. I do want to hit on one little bitty thing I said I was going to come back to. Lil Wayne, what's the connection? <laughs> Let's talk about it. Um, sure. <laughs> so, you know, I worked for a sports agency, so backtrack, uh, when I got out of undergrad, I knew I wanted to work in sports. I wanted to work and represent athletes. And so I originally thought I wanted to be a financial advisor for athletes. My whole purpose in getting to sports was that I saw these athletes, athletes go from rags, exactly where I came from in the hood, to riches, and then they go back to rags. And so I saw this huge need. So I wanted to find a way to effectuate change, and I thought it was by being a financial advisor. So I graduated, I moved to New York City, I worked on Wall Street as an investment banker. I, you know, I went big, I thought, okay, here I am. And I got there and I started meeting with all these financial advisors. I want to be an, uh, a financial advisor for athletes. And they're like, really, that's not what we do. We manage their portfolio, we do their stocks and bonds. It sounds like you want to be an agent. You want to do the day-to-day. -day. You want to be the first call for these athletes. So when I, was, when I learned that, then you know, three months later, I'm taking the LSAT and I applied to law school that quick. You know, I knew what my purpose was. I didn't know the name of it, but the mm -hmm. minute I knew I was on the wrong trail, I deviated real quick. Yeah. So I went to law school. I graduated law school early. I worked at the NFL Players Association for a bit um, while I studied for the agent exam. So at the NFL, you got to take an agent exam. Uh, when I was there, I started reaching out to all these agents. And I'm sorry if this starts to be too long now, but I started reaching out to all these agents and. You know, I ended up working at Players Rep Sports Agency, which was a top 10 sports agency, and we were purchased by Lil Wayne a year and a half ago. So I still work with the same people that I worked with from the first day I got into sports. 
I just have a new boss and a little bit new uh, brandy. And so, yeah, awesome. <laughs> They're giving me the hook. I'm going to ask you guys one word to summarize to leave with this group before you go. Just one word. I know it's kind of hard. You can give them one word. Oh, why? Right. <laughs> yeah. I'll just soulful. So let your actions and your purpose be based on your soul. Beautiful. Beautiful. I'll go with reskill my word. <laughs> First of all, the whole team at Power Hands who provided the video for us to rip the audio from. Thank you so much. Also want to thank Larry Lundy, who is the president of the Black Sports Professionals Network of North Texas. Thank you to Nicole Breitreicher, who was the event producer. Great job, girlfriend. Also want to thank the other lovely ladies on the panel. Danielle Sorensi jones CEO of Power Hands. Andrea Williams, COO of College Football Playoff, and Nicole Lynn, who is that legal eagle and NFL agent, youngest one in the NFL that's female. Also, I want to thank my other episode guest, Cheryl Atkins Green from Mary Kay, CMO. Trudy Bourgeois, the CEO of the Center for Workforce Excellence, and also for the sponsorship for the series, Authentically She. And we still have the opportunity to give away some of her books, so go by the website to do that. And also, thank you, Cheryl Grace, a.k.a. Powerful Penny, and also SVP Ed Nielsen. I am back on the road this week with the Culture Soup podcast. I'm headed to Jackson, Tennessee. That's about 90 minutes outside of Memphis, Tennessee, where the HBCU Lane College is. I'll be joining President Logan Hampton at his first annual leadership summit. It's their inaugural leadership summit. And I'll interview him in a fireside chat the next day, Daryl Bell from a different world. You will remember him as Dwayne Wayne's sidekick, Ron Johnson. He has a lot to say about STEM and media ownership. Follow us at The Culture Soup on Instagram and Twitter. And you can find us online at theculturesoup.com. Can't wait to talk to you again next week. Until then. The Culture Soup Podcast is a production of No Silos Communication.